It was awesome. So uh, Sunday morning, hey, it's amazing. Uh, Pastor just said st- something about, you know, what I'm preaching and sharing, and he said it's for everybody, and I heard of some stirrings and amens and yay. Please understand that the Lord doesn't, doesn't anoint us, give us revelation as teachers and preachers to share stuff that you can't walk in. Like, don't, get, don't, don't ever get deceived and say, you know, well, that works for him, or that's a special anointing, or wow, he's just gifted to walk... No, why would you? Why, I would never go listen to somebody say anything if I didn't believe I could have what they're saying. I don't need entertained. <laughs> I don't need to sit there and get envious. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you can't have what a person's saying, come on, why would you even go listen? Everything that was preached this weekend, we can all walk in by faith. Every one of us can walk in love by faith. But you have to steward your heart. You have to decide where you're at with this truth and what you want with God, right? So a message like this actually is the love of God because it locates your heart. Like I didn't preach in riddles all weekend. I preached pretty clear, I think. I don't think people were going, what's he trying to say? And, and, and that's, the, that's the power of it because when I'm done speaking, it leaves you with one of two choices. You say, man, I hear what he's saying and I want it. Or, well, yeah, I hear what he's saying. I just don't want it. That's really where it leaves you. And that's what the love of God would do because he would want to hold you accountable and locate your heart. Amen? Amen. Amen. So listen, the, the, this morning, Sunday morning, tradition's a sneaky thing. It can be a limiting thing. It can stop the power of God. Or tradition can be embraced and be a beautiful thing if, if, if you keep the heart alive and you keep Jesus in the center of it. I just want to encourage you, don't, don't ever get tricked into coming on Sunday morning because it's Griner and that's where you belong and it's when they have their service and you just show up because it's church time. Have relationship with Jesus. Wake up in the morning and commune with Him. Don't let when you get to church be the first time you have acknowledged the Lord. That becomes religious. And then all of a sudden, church attendance takes the place of knowing Him. But church attendance will never transform your life. Knowing Him will transform your life. Are you with me? Please don't get deceived and just let the things you do for the Lord take the place of knowing the Lord. Jesus said, this is eternal life. John 17, 3. This is eternal life that you might know Him. The only true God and His Son, Jesus Christ, whom He sent. So eternal life has to do with knowing God and having a relationship with the Lord. Getting to know Him and know who He is through communion, through prayer, through feeding on His Word. So the whole reason, Hebrews 10 says, the whole reason we assemble ourselves together and don't forsake the gathering of the believers is in order that we might stir one another up in love and good works. In other words, that we might stay focused on living outward, living expressive, not just turn inward, not just be introverted or segregated, not just hide away in a church service or a church family as a safe haven, but that we'd actually be stirred up to live outward and live expressive and let our light so shine. So if you don't marry coming to this service and going and see there's a beautiful marriage between coming and going we'll miss the whole point of what we're doing on Sunday morning one of the biggest traps of a local pastor is just trying to be creative and come up with ways to do better church to attract people so they want to come to your church and never empower them to live their life in Christ through the week We're not here just to have a blast or have the best worship or say, boy, I just love it there. Oh, I feel so good when I go. I mean, that sounds great on the surface. That's not why we're here. We're here. That can all be a part of our gathering. But the main reason we're here is to be empowered to take that revelation and live it in your life. Like, Like we come here to get encouraged, get sharpened, get empowered so that we look just a little more like him when we leave than when we came. Yeah? And it's really not cool to just not get that message and then go back to normal life or just go back into your home and have the same old attitudes or whatever. Well, you need to knock it off. Well, stop it. Well, and just have feuds and fights and then come back here. You desensitize your heart and you actually entice religion when you don't take your own personal accountability for what you're hearing and being convicted by. Are you with me? That's not a correction. 
I'm not, I'm not being mean. I'm encouraging you to make the most of this weekend and take the revelation and apply it to your life through prayer and communion. And even if you're in a house of five and the other four don't want any parts to do with Jesus, you can know Jesus, walk in Jesus, manifest Jesus, and you can have Jesus very vibrant in your life. You are not threatened by what people don't want and what people do want. You're only threatened by what you fail to give yourself to concerning truth. It takes two to tango, and I'm going to talk about dancing. It takes one to pursue peace. One in Christ is always a majority, I promise you. Wouldn't it be amazing to be in a household and just have that in your heart to where you're never going to throw a log on the fire that you never want to burn? Do you know how many people are praying for a fire to go out in their marriage or a fire to go out in their family and they're throwing logs on it by little quips, little one-liners, little jabs at the end of a sentence and they're actually highlighting what they're frustrated with and throwing more dead wood on the thing that they're hoping goes out. It's true. I've seen it as a pastor over and over. We project, we preach at each other, we're trying to whip our spouse into shape so they live different so our life is more convenient. You don't want your spouse to change because your life gets more convenient. That's as self-centered as it comes. You want your spouse to change so they start walking in the fruit and blessing of what they're created for so they can have fullness in their heart and in their life and be the best they can be. Are you going to benefit from that? Of course. That's not your motive. My wife prayed for me for 13 years to change before I got saved. 13 years she prayed for me to change. I was not a good man. I wasn't a loving guy. I didn't have this smile on my face back then. You say, well, I can't even imagine you like that after seeing you for a couple days. Well, I'm born again. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I put off the old. I put on the new. I'm not the man I used to be. If I told you the details of the man I used to be, you would probably look at me cockeyed and think, I can't even imagine you that way. It's because I'm born again. Yes. I'm not that man anymore. There's nothing about that man that came into new life. I have new life. Old things. I didn't incorporate Jesus into my life. I didn't pray a prayer to go to heaven. I got right with God so I could become everything that he paid for me to be. And so that who I am and how I am is all determined by him. That's what I am today. I'm born again. It's really, really good. My wife prayed for me for 13 years. 13 years. I was unloving. I was insensitive. I was never satisfied. She was never good enough. I demeaned her with my language, my words. She received zero love from me. I lusted after her, I needed her and wanted her on one end and was never satisfied with her on another. After a while it drained her dry, she just died on the inside and she said, I can't do this anymore and she said, I don't want to be in this marriage. I laughed and said, that's great, I was waiting for you to get to this point, I wish it would have happened sooner, I've wasted a lot of time with you. That's how evil and messed up I was. She's the mama of our two kids. And I had zero regard for her. The whole time, 13 years, she's praying for me to change. I never changed. So she walked in a bedroom and she said, I'm so done with him. I remember standing on the back porch. It saddens my heart that we can be so lost and so insensitive to one another and so self-centered. It's, it's tragic what the fall of man did to man. It's tragic how we live at the expense of each other. How we don't think twice about angry words and demeaning words and don't even think about what it'll do to an individual that's not able to handle them. Man, please don't give your life to those things now that Christ has come. Please don't come to Griner Mennonite. Griner, it's not even Griner Mennonite. It's Griner, isn't it? It's bad to say Griner Mennonite. Please, please don't come to Griner Church and not let those things be challenged and changed in your life. Please. Please. Your life matters so much or he wouldn't have paid for it. He wouldn't have paid the price of his life to put his life in you. Don't miss the point. You're worth a whole lot to him when you're living in what he created you for. Amen. Like his death is worth your life in his eyes. You probably ought to believe that. Because yes. <laughs> he really does. And I don't think he needs counsel. <laughs> My wife said she went into a bedroom and she said, I am so done with that man. When, I'm, when I heckled her out on the porch, you know what I told her? I said, well, you're crazy anyway. I'm married to a crazy lady and your whole family knows you're out of your mind and they feel sorry for me because I'm married to a nut. That's how evil I was, man. That's bad stuff. 
because we're having a hard time and she's broken and I'm just digging it in deeper. Digging it in deeper. That's abusive. I could see her shutting down and I could see her stopping herself from crying and she was refusing to cry and she was saying in her heart, I'm done letting this man make me cry. And she was, I don't know how we do it, but she was hardening herself. She went into a bedroom and she said, I'm so done with this marriage. And then she looked up at the ceiling. And this is how analytical works. This is how the court case of your mind functions. She looked up at the ceiling and she said, and you know what? I'm done with you too. I'm finished with you. I prayed to you for 13 years and you've never done a thing. You have allowed me and these children to suffer through hell and you've done nothing. I don't need you either. And she turned and walked out of the bedroom and just walked off into her own self. That's a pretty tough story. I won't share the whole testimony, but I, I got changed at work one night. She was at home, she was a mess. When you're in unforgiveness, it manipulates you. When you have unresolved conflicts, you're not the person you would be if you didn't have unresolved conflicts. You have to understand that everything has children. Discouragement bears fruit and has children. There's things that rise up in your emotions and desires through discouragement that wouldn't be there if you weren't discouraged. There's things that look attractive that wouldn't look attractive at all if you were in fullness and you were healthy and you were okay emotionally. Need can drive people. Everything has children. There's people that step into ministry and they're motivated by frustration. They're motivated by hurt and disagreement. They're not, it's not the call of the Lord. There was a time I wanted to go to the mission field and I thought that God called me to be a missionary and, he, and I was praying these sincere prayers in my bedroom about going to third world countries and wherever and who knows that would be amazing if that's a calling, but it better be a calling, right? And I was like, I don't care about the food and the water, you'll keep me, covenant is greater and, rah, and I'm praying like, rah. and if you'd have listened in, you'd have thought, that guy is hooked up, man, he's surrendered, ain't that some? And, and after I was done praying, I said, I'll go wherever and he said, really, you'll go? You'll go and feed the hungry and you'll go. And I said, yes, Lord. And, and, and the Lord revealed to me that the only reason I had the desire is because deep in my heart, I was frustrated with the people I was pastoring because I didn't believe they appreciated righteousness. And I thought they were spoiled and just wanted God to give them things. And my discouragement towards the people I was pastoring was birthing a desire to run away from that and go to the mission field. My frustration was birthing my desire. It wasn't the call of God. Everything has children. Man, I hope you're hearing me this morning. You can't afford to live in a, in a, in a nasty attitude. You can't afford to be critical. You can't afford to just live frustrated. You can't just be ho-hum. You can't just be whatever, I don't care. Yeah, are you finished yet? Nobody can be honest, look me in the eyes and tell me they're blessed and excited about living that way. Why would you stay there? Why is it even an option? <laughs> I think by now we should know it doesn't produce good fruit. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? So the Lord corrected me and adjusted my heart. So I just wanted to share that little tidbit with you. What happened was I got saved at work and my wife was a mess. And, and when she found out I got saved, and I'm just condensing, I'm not even telling the story. I don't feel like I need to take the time to do the whole story. But when she found out I got saved, she was furious because she thought it was a slap in the face. She had decided to be done with this marriage and for five months we were finished and I was rejoicing that I was finished. It's crazy how timing is and how messed up we are when we're not living Jesus. I know people won't admit that, but man, when you look back, we were messed up when you're not living Jesus. Like I married my wife. She was, she's almost four years older than me. When I was 20, I thought that was amazing. When I met her, I was 19. And when she showed attention to me and acted like she liked me and we could be a, a couple, I thought, this is incredible. I'm 19 and she's 23. Like this is not some high school girl I graduated with. This is a woman. That's what I was thinking at age 19. I got a 23 year old girlfriend and I'm like walking tall, man. I'm like, I got it going on. And I just thought it was amazing. Unfortunately, I had one thing on my mind. And it wasn't Jesus. So now she's 36, almost 37, I'm 33, and we're finished. I remember when I got married, my, my, my best man, his little sister was eight years younger than us. So when you're 20, she's 12. 
Okay, that would be illegal for one thing, and it's just weird, right? But she had a crush on me and just, just thought I was the best thing. And she made it so obvious this little 12 year old girl was cute, but she just liked me. And I remember she was crying on, when I got married on my wedding day, she was crying because it wasn't her. It was just, it was cute back then, right? Now I'm coming out of a convenience store. I'm in a divorce situation. I'm single. I'm looking in the mirror. I'm 33. I'm talking to myself. I'm cheering myself on. I'm saying, Dan, you are sure not the best looking cat on the planet, but somebody's going to need you. Somebody will fall for you. Somebody will be vulnerable. I was smart. I understood how relationships work. People came together because they needed each other for a season. I saw it all the time. I saw it in my whole life. I was, I was a shrewd guy. I was 18 and I had a girlfriend because she didn't have a daddy and I knew that meant something. I wasn't dumb. It's not good. I passed the convenience store door and guess who comes out the door? I look, I looked at her face and I said, and I said her name and she turned and went, oh, and that same starry eye thing came into her and she's 25 now. She's not 12, she's 25. I'm 33. That's different than 20 and 12. 25 and 33 is different than 20 and 12. Are you with me? So guess what I did? I said, whoa, this is perfect. Man, this is perfect. My wife's almost four years older. We're done with that. She's eight years younger. Now that sounds really exciting. You see what we do to each other? Do you think I had anything to give her? Do you think I had any capacity to be with her? Do you think it could have ever been love? Do you think I'm just buying time and using her for what she can do for me? And I'm going to call it love? Come on, let's just get real. I wish I could be more romantic. There's nothing romantic about it. It's deception, vulnerability, and weakness. And they have no business being with her, right? But it's what rose in my temptation and desire. And she had that look in her eye. And I thought, this is going to work. I called my best friend. And, or I called my, the guy that was my best man. And who we weren't even that close at that time anymore. And I called him and I asked him about his sister. And said, he said, well, what are you talking about? You're married. I said, well, no, that's been over for five months. And I just met her at the convenience store. And Man, I could tell she still liked me. And I just thought, how would you feel? Would that be weird to you, man? Are you okay? He said, well, I'm concerned about her. You know, she likes older guys. She just was living with a guy 40. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm a shoe in. So I'm thinking, I'm going to make this happen. I go to work right on the heels of that, have an encounter with God. And he saves me forever, man. I'm saved and I'm changed. So the foolishness never took place. I never carried it out because God intercepted me. So I'm really thankful and I'm really happy because I would have done a boneheaded thing at the expense of another human being because I was living for myself. Oh, I'm so glad. He's so good. But when my wife found out I was saved, she was ticked off, man. She was like slap in the face. I pray all these years. He never got saved. Now we're finished and he's saved. So she came to me and said, I know what you're doing and you're a fool. It ain't going to work. And she was so mad. Why? Because she's already laying out her own life. She's already moving in, cer in certain directions. And she what? Turned her back on truth. Why? Because she's offended at God as well. That's a good sign of self-centeredness when people are mad at God. When the clay has issues with the potter, that should be like, okay, let me reevaluate. <laughs> so seven weeks goes by. She fights me tooth and nail. She does everything she can to break my heart, to make me angry, and to prove that I was a fake. That's what she told me later. She, we, had this, we talked this all out. She said, she said, I tried so hard to break you. She said, my conscience was so violated the way I was living. And, and I couldn't believe you were doing what you were doing. And I wanted to prove it was fake to relieve my conscience. I wanted you to do something to give me liberty to go, aha, and sign off. You see what I'm saying? Because she had her own convictions. Because God loves her. God's not offended at her. Come on. She pumped her fist at God and said that. I think he's a little bigger than that. I think he's going, oh, girl, you are so blind. You have no idea you're letting her cover your heart. I love you so much. He's just chasing her all around. You say, oh, God wouldn't do that. Oh, yes, he would. His love pursued her and pursued her. You ask Hosea about Gomer. You'll find it. You ask God about Israel. You'll find it. He won't stop loving. He's amazing. <laughs> so my wife... 
has an encounter seven weeks after I'm saved. She's going out of her way to hurt me. She's going out of her way to be mean. And that is so not my wife. My wife was tender, gentle, extra mile peacemaker. She was totally perverted because of anger and hostility and unforgiveness. It manipulated her and made her something she wasn't. She's not created for unforgiveness. It manipulated her. So one week, she let weekend, she, she, she was going out of town. I had the kids. She was supposed to be going for like three days and she had a long drive and she was going for like six hours. And so it's like, she's long gone, right? She comes to the house. She sneaks in the back door and I'm sitting with the kids. She peeks around the corner. We're six weeks into my salvation. She wants to catch me in impropriety. She wants to catch me yelling at the kids, watching junk on the TV, doing things I would have normally done. And she wanted to walk in on me unannounced and go, aha, phony, to relieve her conscience as if I'm the answer for her conscience. That's how twisted we get, right? She comes in, she peeks around the corner. Guess what she catches me doing? I'm sitting Indian style in the living room with the book of Psalms open, teaching my 10 and 5 year old what it means to worship God. <laughs> oh, ooh, that's just good. She said she was so mad. She said, because I, I looked up and I said, Hey, are you okay? What are you doing here? And she said, I'm fine. She ran upstairs, came back down and shot straight out the back door and never said a word. She said she was so mad in the car, she was screaming at God. Why would you do this now? Why would you save him now? Why didn't you save him before? It's too late now. Why? And she said she was just freaking out the whole way driving. Can you imagine the turmoil just fighting truth? The following week. She's in the bathroom. She's doing her hair. She's going to go out. She's going to go somewhere. She's getting pretty. She's doing her thing. And the Lord comes in the bathroom. It's pretty interesting. He just walks in the bathroom like he owns the place. <laughs> like he's really secure. He didn't come in sheepish and think, boy, she's really mad at me. He just came in. And she said she had the brush in her hand. And she went, because he was there, standing in the bathroom. She just went, and he spoke to her. She said, it seems audible. She doesn't know, but she could hear it so clear. He said, why are you so angry with that man? Separating me from her anger, that man. Can't you see? She said, when he said the word see, it was like somebody ripped something off of her eyes. And she said it was the veil of unresolved conflicts, all the nasty words, all the anger, all the unforgiveness, all the frustration, all the memories were clouding her over and dulling her heart to where she was sure she never wanted to see me and hated me and never, right? And God said, can't you see? She said it was the most unbelievable experience. It was like he tore all that stuff off of her and left her see things the way they really were. And he said, that's not even the man you are angry with. And then he said something I really, really like. He said, in fact, Kim, that's not even the man you married. I have made him a brand new man. Amen. So God can't lie. So guess what I am? <laughs> Woohoo! So I don't even have to try. <laughs> I'm just going to live changed. Yay. So he says, I have made him a brand new man. She can see this all. She's in the presence of the Lord, guys. She's like, Wah! and she said she just crashed onto the floor in a fetal position, was crying uncontrollably. He hovered over her, just started to love on her, and he wanted to make peace with her because of her little rant. Yeah, about six months, six and a half months before. Almost, almost seven months before, he said, he hovered over and said, it's true, Kim, you prayed for your husband for 13 years, but you don't understand how you tied my hands and kept me from moving on your prayers because you only ever prayed because of pain and hurt. You never once prayed because you loved him or because of mercy. You knew if I would change him, your day would go better. You were reduced 
to another hurting wife that prays. I can't answer that prayer. It's not me. It's not my love. I can't answer that prayer and leave you there. How many people have prayed for their loved ones because of their pain? Because they can't take anymore. Because if God would change them, it would relieve them or make their day better. How many times have we actually looked and saw their life is so much more and had true compassion and mercy for them and knew that if they really knew the Lord, they wouldn't be living where they're living. And instead of that frustrating me, causing me to have compassion for their life. Isn't that what the Lord did for us? Did he come frustrated or did he come with compassion? Were we doing anything right? Did he have compassion? Wow, I guess it would be better to follow him. <laughs> so what God did, he took her eyes off of me, which is what we tend to do. Well, I wouldn't be if you didn't. Well, you should have never. Well, how come you? Well, you. I, I know it sounds like I'm against social media. I'm concerned about it. If you look on social media, that kind of language is everywhere. You look at the average talk show, it's everywhere. He said, she said, tit for tat. Well, I wouldn't be if you didn't. Well, forget it. Well, I don't need Well, you wouldn't. Well, you hurt me. Well, you... Ah, ee, ah, ee, ah. And you don't see an ounce of that in Jesus, his life for God the Father. So he didn't teach us that. So we didn't learn it from him. So why are we so sure it's right? Just amazing how God ministered to my wife. And showed her her heart and got her eyes off of me so she could get her eyes back on her and him. Because when she stands before the Lord on that day. And say she left my life dictate hers. And she lived the rest of her life with that pain. And now she had this one God given life called a gift. Not a dread, not a grind, a gift. And now she stands before the Lord in the presence of light and truth. There's no darkness, there's no deception. And she walks in there and goes, oh, could you imagine the horror of that? When you see clear and realize you've been deceived and you've left one man decide your life and it wasn't Jesus? Do you, can you imagine her saying, uh, I, look, I would have believed you if it wasn't for him. Why didn't you change him? You're not even going to be able to think that. You'll know it's wrong. So if you know it's wrong, why would you let it work now when it's not going to work then? Why would you let a mindset buy time now that isn't going to be realistic then? You get it? Dan, why do you preach this stuff all the time? Because without these things, you'll never run well. You'll go to church, you'll have high moments, but you'll have low moments. You won't be consistent, and people won't even be impressed with the Jesus in your life because you're not impressed with the life that he gave you because you're not seeing it. And all of a sudden, you're living up and down instead of growing from faith to faith and glory to glory in the day of the righteous, brighter and brighter. Are you with me? Come on, it's very important what I'm saying. Your attitudes are huge and important. Your motives, your perspectives are, are huge to the way you're going to walk out your one God-given life. The why behind your life, your reason for being, your motivation is huge. If you don't have healthy motivation, you'll just live by the wisdom of the world. And you'll be up and down. You'll have highs and lows. And you'll live by the moment. And life will decide who you are and how you're doing. And your circumstances will always define you. And if people do you right, you'll feel secure. And if people do you wrong, you'll feel insecure. And life is determining you. And you're, you're determined and bought by men in a sense. When the whole time you're called to live in Christ Jesus. Are you all with me? Amen. So God did that to my wife. My wife came running out in the yard. I was working in the garden. I heard the door bang and I looked and she slammed the door open so hard. The garage door went so boom. And here's my little wife running hard. She's running hard at me. And she wouldn't even come to me. I mean, I'm looking for knives, guns. No, I'm not. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I never thought that. I'm just having fun. She's running and I can hear her. I thought somebody died. Honestly, I thought she got a phone call that you never want to get. I thought she got a phone call, a tragic phone call, and somebody in our family got, died, car wreck something, because she was wrecked. She's bawling, running hard. And I thought she's, it's, the news broke her down. And even though she felt like she hated me, she's running to me because the news was so traumatic. That's what crossed my mind. Somebody died. Unexpected. But I could hear her talking, talking real fast as she's running, and it sounded repetitive. 
And as she got closer, she's crying so hard, I couldn't un I'd understand her. And then she got closer, like this close, boom, and wrapped around me and had her head planted right here. First time in almost seven months that we had been in anything like that. Well, then I just started crying. It was a messy scene. It was bad. She's a blah, and I'm like, blah. It was just bad. But she's going, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Boom. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I'm like, sorry, you sorry. I've been a knothead. I've been so selfish. I've been so arrogant. I've been so bad, man. I was a mess. I'm sorry, right? She's going, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And it bothered me that she's saying she's sorry because in my eyes, she went the extra mile. She's a peacemaker. She tried so hard. I couldn't see that before. Before I got saved, I'd have told you it was all her fault and living with her was a challenge and blah, 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 blah. As soon as I got saved, I realized 30 minutes later after I got saved, I thought, oh my goodness, my wife is amazing. She tried, why? Love came into me. Everything changed. I looked through his eyes. And for the first time saw the truth and it wasn't clouded and I realized how precious my wife was and how hard she tried and how bad I tested her and drained her and tried her and it made me feel bad but I didn't have a voice I couldn't just go to her and tell her that she'd have clawed my eyes out it was like you know you can't just say well you know look I'm sorry oh yeah so I just grew in Jesus and I let Holy Spirit work with her and that's why he came in the bathroom because I wasn't trying to be Holy Spirit I wasn't insecure. I wasn't like, you got to heal my marriage. I prayed one time. I said, Lord, I blew this thing out of the water. I hurt this little girl. I would love a chance to love her like you love me. And I would love to be Christ to her in, in my marriage. So if you see fit to redeem it, which I believe you want to, I'm just going to let that up to you. But man, I'm coming after you. You make me what you paid for. I'm coming after you. Never prayed for my marriage one more time. Never even thought about it. I just got into knowing God. Here's the thing. We always say, man, bring my spouse back. Can you pray that God brings my spouse back? Well, probably not. I probably won't pray that. I'll pray that Christ gets formed in you. Let's pray that Christ gets formed. Let's take this as a season for Christ to get formed in you. I don't think the goal of God is just to get you back so you're technically together. I think he wants to build himself in you that he has something to bring them back to called him in you. Yeah? I don't think he just wants to repeat performance. Hey, you're supposed to be with him. Get back here, girl. <laughs> Hey, where there you are. Hey, buddy, this is your wife. I don't think he's into that. I think he's into forming people in Christ and then bringing them back to who he is in them. Does he want us together? Yeah. Is marriage amazing? Yeah. Is it holy and sacred? Absolutely. Is it supposed to be forever? Let no man put it asunder? Absolutely. Because if we ever become love, we'll understand that. And if you aren't in that arena and you've already mixed that up in your life, don't be judged by that. Be judged by the truth and say, you know what? I'm going to learn through this and I'm never going to let this be my life again. And boom, 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 boom. I see people that get a hold of the truth and they say, man, if I'd have saw this then, I might have handled it different. I might have seen we forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. So it's important that you don't get condemned by the truth, that you embrace it and let the truth make you everything it paid for you and created for you to be so that you never repeat performance. It's that you grow in understanding. Are you with me? Yes. Yeah. So she's saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I'm like, Kim, why are you so sorry? Are you kidding me? I said, I have been wanting to tell you how sorry I am and what I see. And I was bawling. And she said, no, I'm sorry. And she was like adamant about being sorry. And I was perplexed. I'm like, what could this girl possibly be sorry for? And I said, what are you sorry for? She looked me right in the eyes, crying profusely, Robert. And she said, for not loving you in prayer. I said, what? She said, I knew if God would change you, my life would be easier. And it's the only reason I prayed for you because I was mad at you. I didn't pray because I loved you. And she fell on me and I went, what? It was messy. I talked to her about our marriage. She said, do you think there's hope for our marriage? I said, are you kidding me? I am finally in a position and ready to love you like he loves his church. I would be honored to love you as my wife. If you'll let me. She said, okay, yeah. 
what? And I said, can I renew my wedding vow to you? She said, what? I'm a spontaneous man. That's how I preach. I was ready to do my wedding vow. I'm seven weeks old in the Lord, man. I'm like, can I renew my wedding vow? I didn't have no idea this was going to happen. But I'm ready to do the vow, baby. I ain't got a bunch of crumpled papers at the nightstand trying to be elegant and baggy eyes because I didn't sleep all night trying to say the right thing. I didn't even know this moment was coming. And I said, can I renew my wedding vow to you? She said, what? I said, can I? She said, okay. And this is what came out of my heart. This is what I was learning in seven weeks. A psychologist, a, a psychologist, a secular psychologist, a world psychologist, some Christian psychologist would try to crucify you for this and say, you can't, no, a marriage is a lot of work. A marriage is 50-50. A marriage is, no, a marriage is I love you. All that is mine is yours, and I'll lay down my life to bring out your highest good. I see the beauty of who you're created to be, and I will lay down my life to empower that. That's marriage. I love you. Marriage isn't I need you. Marriage isn't, hey, don't you break my heart. Don't you pull out on me. You're the best thing that ever happened to me. I don't know what I'd do without you. Don't you do me wrong. It would just crush me. That's not marriage. That's self-centered deception. Marriage is, I love you. You have a covenant with God that's cut through his son. The blood of his son it can never be broken. You can step out of fellowship, but you can't break the covenant. The covenant's forever. You step into fellowship with that covenant because it's through God and his son and his blood. It's already sealed. You can't break the covenant. What, what happens when people backslide and they get repentant and they come back and they're sincerely sorry? What's God say? He doesn't say, well, man, you really put my emotions through the runaround. It's good I don't slumber because you'd have kept me up all night. I'll tell you, I don't even know what. No, he says, I love you. When people are sincere and they come back, what's he say? I love you. Two weeks later, he doesn't cry. You don't go to prayer and find him crying. And he says, I just can't believe you did that to me two weeks ago. I just can't believe that you went over there. And after all the time we've had together and all the things we've spent, I just can't believe you've done that to me. But I'm still okay. I mean, I forgive you. <laughs> Here's my wedding vow to my wife. I said, you owe me nothing in this marriage but to receive the love of God from me. And as long as I draw breath on this earth, I will serve you in his unfailing love. And she said, okay. And I didn't say, get a pen and paper. I want to write your vow down and make sure I hold you to it. I just pulled her in and held her. And I've been loving her for 25 years. She went through eight years of identity crisis, was suicidal and wouldn't even come to church when I was a full-time pastor. That shouldn't burn me out. That should make me want to love her all the more because she's in trouble. That shouldn't frustrate me. I shouldn't be self-centered and say, well, I can't keep living this way. Well, she doesn't want to pull her weight. Well, it takes two, you know. A marriage is two. Don't you try to sell me that language. You're way too late. I've walked through this for eight years. Some people say eight years because they wouldn't make eight days or eight weeks. But here's the problem with that. Truth doesn't know time. So why do we let time change truth? Come on. Oh, I'm, I feel the challenge in the room right now. It's good. I like these moments. <laughs> yeah. You see how confident my speech is? Because I was in those shoes for eight years. And I know it's way more than possible to say I love you in the midst of it all. It's possible to wake up every morning and understand that she doesn't owe you a thing. That your, your, your reason you're alive is to manifest him. The reason you're alive is to let your light so shine. You're on the earth for one reason, to manifest his image. And if you miss that and you think you're on, your, on, the, if you think you're on the earth to be married, you're going to let your marriage decide you. If you're on the earth to manifest him, you're going to let that decide you. If you wake up and know nobody owes you a thing, you're already free. So my wife can't fail me. I'm not living for her to do anything right. I'm living through what he did right. And I'm in the greatest capacity to love I've ever been. And I've never been more free. And eight years of deception in my wife's life, it got so bad. One day, my 12-year-old had to intervene because she started to blame shift and justify some things because she was so condemned and I couldn't even talk to her. She'd just look at me and say, you're supposed to say that. It doesn't mean it's true. Well, I would expect you to say that. It's the right answer. 
There was a time she'd say, it'd be better if I would just die. You could go free. I said, I am not in bondage. You are not a burden to me. Yeah? Yay. I'm a good husband. <laughs> Actually, I'm being silly with you. I would be a terrible husband if it wasn't for truth. But if you embrace truth, you'll become what he paid for. And it's way more than possible. Here's the, here's the tough part. You can hardly share this testimony in church, not the world, in church and have it fully received because people aren't living there and don't even believe it's possible and have so much pain in their relationships. Yes. That it's actually hard to nail this thing in church. Yeah. Wow. Oh, I'm going to preach it till the day he takes me and... The word will still be forever anyway. You're going to have to hear this for eternity, man. It's going to be the truth. <laughs> Having a nurse passing away. So are your feelings, emotions, circumstances, and situations. But my word will remain forever. And I'm telling you, Jesus is coming on a white horse. King of kings and Lord of lords. And there's a sword in his mouth. I just got all my hairs up. <laughs> and he's going to judge the nations by his word. Yes. And what you believe isn't what you say. What you believe is what you live. You know them by their fruits. So your life lived is what reveals what you actually embraced and believed. So when she gives me every opportunity in the flesh and through psychological counseling to be a hurt man, a broke man, move on. Hey, my life is short. She doesn't want to get it. She's proved after eight years she's not going to, you know, I have too much to do. I have such a call. She's holding me back. Sometimes people don't just want to change. Hey, brother, you got to move on with your life. God doesn't expect you to... All that counsel's in the church. It's demonic. It's not the Lord. It's unscriptural. It's flesh driven. And the people that are counseling it know they'd feel that way. So they're giving that counsel because it's all they can relate to. And Jesus would never tell you that. They asked Jesus about divorce. And he said, it's, 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 it's not an option. And, they, and, and, and then they said, well, then why did Moses give us certificates of divorce? And he said, only the reason Moses, Moses, not God, the only reason Moses, not God, Moses gave you that certificate is because of the hardness of your hearts. But it wasn't this way from the beginning. Amen. For man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall be joined and become one, and whatever God has put together, let no man, let no man, no hard heart, no man, no counselor, no court put asunder. Why? Because we were created to love and love never fails and love doesn't seek its own. So when God created man and instituted marriage, there was no hurt and offense and discouragement and self-centeredness and frustration and anxiety because there was love. And the goal of our instruction is love. And we're quick to say, I love you, but we're not quick to live, I love you. Because usually I love you means I need you. Don't break my heart. I need you. Don't hurt me. I need you. Keep me fulfilled. That's why the people closest to us hurt us the most. Because they're the ones we need to keep moving forward. And we call it love. But it's not love at all. You all alright? You all just like... You ought to see your faces. <laughs> Got me a little nervous. <laughs> You all good? So is there redemption in all this? Absolutely. Is there truth in all this? So you say, well, now, brother, I'm just shipwrecked because I'm already divorced and I'm remarried. I am not a legalist. Listen, if you're hearing this and going, whoa, listen, it doesn't change a thing. It should change you so that you never teach yourself to live this way again and think it's normal and acceptable. 
So you fall in the mercy of God. You repent and you let God come upon you. Now people that have this knowledge and have this conviction, they can create another thing when they just choose to stay willful and just keep doing the same things. That's a scary position. That's a whole other topic. Most people aren't in that arena. Most people are in the arena where they, they don't even want to hear what you're saying because the shoes fit and, and they don't know where to go from here and they're feeling bad because of their history, their life, and their decisions. Look, the gospel always gives you hope and an answer and mercy triumphs over judgment. What he's saying through messages like this is don't repeat performance. Get a grip and be pursuing love and become that thing. Yeah? We just talked about it the other day. You know, there's people that just believe if you've divorced, if you're married. Look, he, he, he said to a lady that had five husbands and the man she was with wasn't even her husband at the well. He had a word of knowledge. He spoke that out. She said, surely you're a prophet. Here's what he told her. If you'd ask of me for a drink, I'd have gave you a drink and you'd never thirst again. He didn't say, boy, it's a shame you already had five husbands or I'd have gave you a drink if you'd ask. But because you had five husbands, I can't give you the drink. She wasn't disqualified because of her history. She's qualified because of him. And the whole goal of him is to transform her, to change in her history, to rewrite her destiny. So that she doesn't continue to live in this weakness and repeat performance, but gets born again and has a new resume. If her history would have disqualified her, why would he have offered a drink and she'd never thirst again? You know why she had five husbands and the man she was with wasn't her husband? Because she was a very thirsty lady. There was an emptiness inside of her that only Jesus could fulfill. Who relates to that? Come on, there's people out there that have been super promiscuous. There's women out there that have done things that they thought they'd never do because of that gnawing and drawling. And then they say, oh, I can't do this no more. And that thing comes back on them and they find themselves in another situation, another situation. And then that thing comes on them because of society and all the names and all the things you judge yourself to be. And next thing you know, you're just like, whatever. And this is you. And you put the thing on like a cloak and you just keep living that way. God does not disqualify you. He doesn't disown you. He doesn't say you've gone too far. He comes after you. He wants to redeem you. He wants to wash you up on the shore and breathe life into you so that he can fill that thing so you never repeat performance. It's, it's not just evil all the time. Sometimes it's so blindness. It's deception. It's emptiness. It's wrong believing. It's unresolved conflicts. It's hurt. Sometimes you get touched. You get touched wrong as a young age. And then that thing starts to manipulate you. You have encounters and, and, and touched at a young age. And that thing tries to, to mark you and shape you. And God the whole time is trying to reach you with truth and get the veil off of your eye. You see what I'm saying? Okay. I'll close with this. I'll close with this and I'll be done. We'll get out of here in good time. It's not because, honestly, I'm not here for the steak. The steak is really good. I can't tell you exactly why I'm here. I just know that I really, really felt like coming. I just can't explain it any other way. Uh, now that I'm here, I can kind of figure it out because I know the history a little. I know there's been shifts and changes. And I know there's stuff and I know there's background stuff. I know all that. But I'll tell you what, I have been so received all week and there is such a receptivity in this room. There is such a hunger and a humility of heart. Last night was off the hook, the, the, the hunger. You're like little birdies in a nest. And it was just so easy to just go. Bwah. I mean, I usually go Bwah, anyway. But <laughs> I do. <laughs> it was just so easy. But it felt received. It seemed like there was, it was just good ground. You know, sometimes we think, oh man, Dan came back three times. I wonder if we really need it. You know, he must know we need it. It's not like that. Don't think negative. Wonder if Dan came back three times because God found people that want to hear it. Wonder if he found people that want to do something with it. Wonder if he's investing into people that are going to run a race. Wonder if that's why I came back the third time. Wonder if you're actually positioned more than ever as a church to take this thing and run, man, and never look back. Wonder if you're actually positioned. Wonder if there's people in here that the third time it just something sinks in and something just goes click and all of a sudden you go, yeah. yeah. You get what I'm saying? It's not because, well, we must really need it. Dan's coming back again. Guess we didn't get it the first two times. It's, wonder if that's not it at all. I don't think that's it at all. I'm going to tell you a beautiful story. It'll, it'll wrap up the weekend. Last night, I had fun last night preaching righteousness. 
Man, don't you wake up and be self-conscious. If you, if you find yourself self-conscious and introspecting and, 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 and low-esteemed and feeling yucky about yourself and you look in the mirror and you get caught up in facial features or hair texture, don't get so caught up. If you catch yourself doing that, shift and start finding your value in Christ. Because if you don't make that shift, you're going to try to replace that emptiness through something. You're going to need a compliment. You're going to need somebody to take interest in you. It makes you so vulnerable and susceptible in life if you don't find yourself through him. It's just true. Okay, I want to show you a story because it came on my heart in worship. It's rare I get a heads up on something I'm supposed to share. I can't even tell you that happens once in a blue moon, whatever time frame that is. It happens once in a long period of time where I'm actually sitting there and God says, I want you to share this in the service. I usually just get up here and have the, the dear sister came and said, do you have any scriptures that you want us to put on the board today? I said, honey, I didn't even think about the service yet. I don't even have a clue. <laughs> Honestly, I'm sorry. I wish I could give you a better answer, but I haven't even thought about the service. Like, cause see some people think, what? You should have been up all night studying and praying and reading. No, no. The Lord told me to never read my Bible to preach a sermon. He said, read your Bible to know me and only ever speak out of who I am in your life. And he said, that'll carry weight. So that's the grace on my life. So that's what I do. Okay. So if you'll go to Genesis with me, if you want to, if you don't want to, just listen along. Genesis. Let me see if I can find this. I think, I think I can find it quickly. The one I checked out. Okay. I want to read this to you. I'm just going to read two sections of scripture and then I'm going to flip and I want to show you something. Because I've been talking about how clean we are through the blood, right? I've been talking about Jesus ruling his kingdom with a scepter of righteousness. So when you're forgiven, you're forgiven. That he's taken away the sins of the world. We saw last night he forgave us of all sin, cleanses us of all unrighteousness. That the strength and the power of the finished work of Christ is you waking up in right standing with God. Having the ability to go before him with no sense of guilt, condemnation, or shame. And know that he sees you in his sight, holy, blameless, and above reproach, as if you've never missed the mark. That's phenomenal. What a gift from the Lord. Now, I'll be honest, as a pastor, my experience over the years, a wee, tiny, small percent of Christians live that way and actually believe that and apply that truth to their life. They stay self-conscious, they stay guilty, they feel condemned, they feel bad about their lives, they're still worried, regretting yesterday, and rarely do I see people just put on Christ and just say, thank you for making me clean. I did a little survey for years asking people what their communion life looks like with God, and some of them were people at our church that I was pastoring and teaching this stuff to, and I found that in the mid to upper 90% of people, that's scary, have never initiated communion with God and just expressed His love for them with, without being in a service, just stopping in the kitchen, God, thank you for loving me today. I so appreciate how you see me today. I so love being your child. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for living in me. Most people didn't even know they could do that, let alone actually step into that. The people that knew they could do that weren't giving themselves to that. I found that 90 some percent of Christians had never initiated communion with God and received his love and declared it over their life. 90 some percent. Don't be in the 90 some. Yeah? Now Sarah, Sarai, Genesis 16. Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. And he had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So you guys know that God promised Abraham he was going to have a son, right? So time passed by. A lot of time passed by. Maybe theologically, what, 13 years or so? Something like that. A lot of time went by. God said, hey, you're going to have a child. And old Abe, I mean, he's an old man. He's pushing 100. And Sarah, she's an old girl. And I, I'm thinking, you know, if he's going to have a baby, he's got to get something going here. And he's probably thinking, man, so for 13 years, he's trying to rev the motor. And Sarah's trying to cooperate. I mean, for 13 years, they're trying to make this happen. It's just funny. <laughs> I mean, I don't think he was just sleeping beside her expecting God to just puff up her belly. He had a maidservant, Hagar. So Sarai said to Abraham, See now, the Lord has restrained me. The Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Watch what she said. This is astounding. 
And the men in the Bible, man, they were super promiscuous. You look at these kings, they had like a couple hundred concubines, you know. They're like that's super promiscuous. I'm sure Abraham didn't say, well, Sarah, let me pray about it. He said, you want me to go into Hagar? And you're okay with that? Yeah, I think you ought to try to have a baby with her. Hagar! I don't think he took fasting and prayer into consideration. He had wife's permission, and he said, let's go. Let's get Hagar. I think you have a great idea, girl. So Sarah said to Abraham, See, now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham heeded the voice of Sarah. <laughs> Look at chapter 18. This is where the three, the three came, the three men came to Abraham and he perceived them to be, it's the Lord. They said to him in verse nine, they said to him in verse nine, where is Sarah, your wife? So he said here in the tent. And he said, I will cer certainly return to you according to the time of life and behold Sarah your wife shall have a son Sarah was listening in the tent door which was behind him now Abraham and Sarah were old well advanced in age and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing therefore Sarah meaning when she heard this she laughed within herself saying after I've grown old shall I have pleasure my Lord being old also question mark and the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Saying, shall I surely bear a child since I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life. And Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it saying, I didn't laugh for she was afraid. And she said, or, and he said, no, but you did laugh. Isn't that some story? Let's go to Romans chapter 4. He's talking about Abraham in Romans chapter 4. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'll just jump in. Verse 13. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be accounted to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but those who are of faith. Of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now watch. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. Watch this. In the presence of him whom he believed. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things that are not as though they are. Who con He's talking about Abraham. Who contrary to hope, in hope, Believe so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. Watch this. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead. Since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness, he did not consider that. And he did not consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. Watch. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Watch this. And being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to Abraham as righteousness. Now that sounds awesome, but let me ask you something. Is that the story we just read in Genesis 16? Was Abraham fully convinced? Did he not waver? 
Didn't he go into Hagar to produce a son because God restrained a child? Didn't he second guess? Didn't he live in unbelief? Didn't he make a big mistake and sleep with his maidservant? And have a child that was of his flesh and not the promise that couldn't stand before God. But when you read Romans, there's nothing mentioned. It makes Abraham sound like he's the most incredible man of faith you've ever met. And he didn't waver. He didn't flinch. He didn't backpedal. He didn't reconsider. But when you read the story in Genesis, he was full of unbelief. And he second guessed and he analyzed and he sinned. Am I being right? What's your point, Dan? Because now I'm confused. The Bible's lying. No. The Bible is in Romans. It's New Covenant. It's after the blood. So repentance is a powerful thing. So Abraham, after he wavered, and after he stood before God in Genesis 17, he repented and got his heart straight and got back on track with God. And he said, oh, that Ishmael might stand before you in Genesis. And he said, there's no way. He's the son of your flesh. It'll be the son of promise. Stand before me and be blameless. And he reiterates the covenant. Abraham, at that point, repents and says, be it unto me, God. Let it be so. I'm going to stand and agree. I'm going to do this thing. I'm I'm going to believe you. All that Romans remembers through the blood of Jesus is his faith, is his repentance, and his life after change. The true story in Genesis and the facts are he slept with Hagar. He second guessed. He followed the advice of his wife who wavered. And they produced a son outside of the will and grace of God. That's what happened in fact. All that heaven remembers through the blood is his repentance and his life after change. And he trusts God and heaven makes him a patriarch of faith and says he was fully convinced and he did not waver it's the beauty of repentance let me show you something this is so powerful you got to get this and wear this and understand this in your life and never ever look back again paul said there's only one way i'm ever going to arrive and attain to what he called me to and it's i forget what lies behind he didn't do two things he did one thing i forget what lies behind and I reach forward to what lies ahead look in look in Hebrews 11 would you with me please real quick verse 11 by faith Sarah herself by faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed and she bore a child even though she was past the age because he judged or she judged because she judged him faithful who had promised therefore from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude innumerable as the sand of the sea by the seashore that doesn't sound like Genesis 18 Genesis 18 she laughed and she lied to God in about a three-minute period he said, Sarah's going to have a baby. She's listening and goes, huh, am I going to have a baby? Hebrews says she judged him faithful to perform. In Genesis 18, she laughed and sarcastically mocked the suggestion. When God said to Abraham, why'd Sarah laugh? Saying, surely you shall have a son. Sarah said, I didn't laugh. I didn't laugh because she was afraid. He said, oh no, but she did laugh. She laughed. At the prophecy of God and she lied when God asked why she laughed she said I didn't <laughs> she laughed and she lied in Genesis 18 in Hebrews 11 she's a patriarch of faith that we're supposed to follow and by faith she received strength to conceive because she judged him faithful what's it noting what's it keeping record of how come the record of Genesis isn't in Hebrews because he's seeing her through the blood which speaks better things he's not noting the time where she was weak he's noting the time where she believed and the thing that she did wrong is so no remembered no more that it's not recorded in the New Testament why because of the power of the blood and I'll remember your lawless deeds no more when he says it he's serious and he's not lying and he's not fabricating facts it's the way he works it's his covenant it's how he lives it's what love sees so Abraham is an example of faith and Sarah is an example of faith you say oh yeah but they blew it they this and that no 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 they rebounded they regrouped and they didn't look back and God judged them as faithful as they judged him as faithful and their sin is not 
on the record. The new covenant records show them as believers, not sinners. Believers, not doubters. Believers, not liars. Believers. Are you with me? I was sitting there and the Lord said, I want you to share that with this house. You look at the original story. It's different than the story that faith remembers or or that heaven remembers through the blood and through the new covenant truth. Abraham and Sarah are examples. He's saying they're patriarchs of faith and they're a cloud of witnesses as examples to us that we should follow their footsteps as they've received the promise. Do you see how much hope that gives everybody in this room? Do you see how everybody in this room ought to say, you know what? It ain't about where I haven't been. It ain't about what I've done wrong and what I've messed up in. It's about where I go with God from here and how I take him at his word and how I grow up into truth right now. It's about the rest of my life and making the most of the moment and stopping getting caught up in other things, wrong attitudes and stuff that have never produced fruit. Ah, man, my life is not my own. I'm going to surrender myself to him and I'm going after the prize. I'm going to live full bore and go after Jesus. Are you with me? It was a long time ago. I was sitting on my bed reading my Bible and I was reading Hebrews and, and then I thought, Sarah. I said, man, I'm really honoring that girl. If I remember right when I read Genesis, she laughed, she lied. She... And then I looked and checked out Abraham and I realized in Romans 4, it made it sound like he lived flawless before the Lord. You go back to Genesis, it looked like he made a big mistake and had a little go around with Hagar. Heaven doesn't remember that. Heaven remembers his belief, his repentance, and his change. Repent, people, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent doesn't mean boo-hoo, I'm sorry. Repent means change the way you think. I don't know if you know who Bill Johnson is, but he has the greatest definition I've heard on repentance. He said re, like recycle, rehabilitate, redo. It's a little prefix to do over again. To re, the re, it's a prefix. Pent is the top floor of a high-rise building. Rethink from the highest view. Repent. The kingdom of God is here. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. You guys good? Can I pray over you guys? Going to pray over you guys. Just listen. Just see if we need to do anything else. Nope, I'm going to pray over you guys. Listen, I'm cheering you on. Everybody sitting here can live what I'm preaching. Yes. The just live by faith. Yes. I'm telling you, never was a time to be discouraged. Certainly now isn't. Don't let life speak louder than truth. Don't let how life is going decide how you are and who you are. Let the giver of life decide how you are and who you are. And realize you have a higher purpose than circumstances. You're called the shine in the midst of it all. Somebody does you wrong, don't live done wrong. If somebody betrays you, don't live betrayed. Because Jesus did you right. That's how you know you're growing. When you get betrayed and you don't feel betrayed or live betrayed, that's how you know you're maturing. When somebody mistreats you and you don't even feel mistreated. When somebody says something hurtful and you don't know how to hurt anymore because you see a higher truth and you realize they're talking out of their own pain. Oh my goodness. That's when you know you're growing. First John 4 says it like this. In this love is perfected. That we have boldness in the day of judgment. Early in the chapter it says he is love. Two verses later because he is love. He is love. It says this is how we know love has been perfected. Because we have boldness in the day of judgment. What a good, good thing. Boldness in the day of judgment. You read about the day of judgment, it's darkness and gloom, it's fear and trembling, there's people freaking out, they don't want to face the glory of the Lord because they're not ready. It says you can have boldness in the day of judgment. How can you have boldness? Because you prayed a prayer to go to heaven? Here's how you have boldness. Because as he is, so are we right here in this world what's that mean when he looks into you he sees who he is in you and you have walked in who he is in this earth towards others and you have boldness because you're one 
It's talking about walking in love. Love doesn't seek its own. Love takes no account, not some, no account of the wrong done to it. Love lays down its life for another. The only way you overcome the enemy, it's not just through the blood and the word. It's love, not your own life unto death. If you refuse to die to everything you've ever been, you'll never live to everything that he is. You good? That's my little final cheer on, rah, rah, go for it, guys. Because you know what the truth is, and I'm not being arrogant. I'm going to fly home today. I'm going to stay blessed and excited and live Jesus all the days of my life. And there's nothing nobody can do about it. It's too late. I'm having the time of my life. And nothing's going to change that. But because I believe it's true for you, it sure is worth flying here and crying it out from my heart. I don't even know if I'll see you again, but I know one thing. We can live this thing together and live in the unity of faith. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to finally pray over you. I said it'd be done at 1130. Pastor, I'm dead on, man. This is good. Woo-hoo. You got the girl going? He made me the best steak when I was here. But it didn't influence my decision to come back. But unfortunately, we are. He already said something, too, before I pray. I I am going to have to slip out again. I know I did that Saturday morning. Kind of have to do that again today. Because I have an afternoon flight. I have to be over at the airport mid-afternoon. He wants to take me over for lunch. So if you guys could just understand that and respect that. I don't want to get hung up in in, in any long thing. You know, highs, goodbyes are okay. But I have to make my way out of here pretty soon. Okay? I appreciate that. You guys were amazing Saturday morning. Like, nobody even looked at me. (laughs) It's like... They were like, we're not even looking at him. <laughs> Usually when I make that announcement in a church, people still run me down. Hey, listen, I know, but look, I'll be quick. Hey, nobody even looked at me on Saturday. I'm like, man, I never saw people honor that request like that. Your people are amazing. It was like, <laughs> why don't we stand to our feet? Can we? Isn't God good? Yeah. Y'all get something out of this morning? Yeah. yeah? yeah.